welcome to this special interview on Eating Now. We are in conversation with Rohini Nidhekini, one of India's leading philanthropists. She's a prolific author. She's worked very closely in the areas of education, sanitation, water, uh, books, literacy for the last uh, uh, couple of decades. And uh, Rohini, thank you very much for joining us on Eating Now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amir. It's been a while since we've spoken, and I think the first time since the COVID-19 pandemic broke out. So tell me how life has changed for you at a personal, professional level. Uh, what has fundamentally changed in your life after the pandemic and the subsequent lockdowns? So well, like for everybody, life has changed a lot, both in good and bad ways. I think uh, in terms of bad, uh, you know, it's really not so much what's happening to us, the privileged, uh, but uh, what's happening to the rest of the people. And uh, that, that leaves a big impact. Uh, personally, of course, uh, we are very well placed. We, we shouldn't complain, and we're not complaining. But obviously, it is a sea change for many people, and we have to do a lot to set things right now. Uh, who would have thought right in December that we would be uh, in this situation in June? So, certain uncertainty has become the new certainty, so uh, that's the bad side. On the good side, I think uh, there's a lot of people, and including me, have learned through this pandemic about what, what is important in life, you know, uh, about the dignity of labor, about, uh, you know, the whole process of society, economy. Uh, so that's what one has had a chance to introspect on instead of rushing about uh, doing things. Right. In fact, the way society, markets, the state, in track has changed so much, lines are blurring all the time. What do you make of it? How can we leverage this opportunity at, at the intersection of state, society, and market? Yeah, that's a big and deep question. And this whole continuum of Samaj Bazaar Sarkar is what my work has been all about over the last three decades. And my contention is that we really need to work on the Samaj side. Because Samaj is the foundation, the basis of everything else that markets and uh, the state are created to serve the Samaj. And sometimes that has got confused. Sometimes we behave like consumers first. Sometimes we behave like subjects of the state first. We need to reassert our citizenship now. And what better time than this, which has really taught us about the importance of society, about the importance of community, about the importance of our neighbors. So that's where my work has been placed. And this has been an opportunity for me to strengthen that work by supporting civil society more and doubling down on my philanthropy because it is the civil society sector, as you have seen, that have been the first responders. While markets have been uh, not to no fault of theirs, they have been frozen right in the last few months, except for a few sectors. And state has been, you know, overwhelmed, right? So this is a good time for us to really think as citizens, what belongs to the citizen sector, what should belong to the state, and what belongs to markets. And education, health, telecommunications, uh, natural resources, some of these things, it is a time to reimagine the balance between Samaj Bazaar Sarkar. Especially in health and education, which, as you know, are really topics of intense debate right now everywhere. Right. I was just coming to that, Tarumini. If you look at the policy response, has this again reinforced that a centralized top-down approach will not work. It has to be community-based. Uh, it has to be, you know, local governments that are empowered. Because, as you said, they are the first respondents, and that's where India's strength lies. We may not have ICUs and hospitals, but we do have primary healthcare centers and communities uh, in villages. That's something that we have to leverage. Yeah. Um, no, I couldn't agree more. I think. Uh the principle of subsidiarity, which is the thing should be solved at the first level, at the lowest, pos nearest possible level to the problem, right? That, that principle has become more important than ever. So how do we uh, look at, the, see, the COVID response? While we do need the state to be very strong and create the frameworks for all of us to act, um, I think it's become increasingly clear it's the closest uh, community, the closest health center, the closest administrative unit 
that has the flexibility and the resilience to respond in context right mm -hmm. so definitely the the argument for a balance between centralization and decentralization you know, decentralize as much as possible but keep some obviously keep some uh, larger uh, power and authority to be able to set frameworks and do good regulation to precisely to allow people to respond in context so i think that has become more clear than before right i just want to touch upon one aspect that you said that you know it's reinforced the need to double down on philanthropy to uh, double down on these efforts um you're someone who signed the giving pledge and in the last few months we have seen how billion millionaire gates have been uh, investing in various vaccine programs across the world uh, how their investments have become crucial what do you think indian philanthropists business leaders can do uh, can do we have we of course have seen the likes of the infosys start up with pro leading from the front in terms of investment in terms of channeling the csr activities that they already do but is there a more cohesive way of doing this for the country like so yeah there are many ways to unleash the power of philanthropy now csr is a sort of a blunt instrument right because by law they have to follow all those draft rules they have to do exactly what government has written down so that kind of puts a cage around philanthropy uh, which is why i've always thought of it as a tax by other means some good has come out of it but from csr you can't expect the world to change actually so if you move to private philanthropy then there is a huge opportunity that some of us have tried to uh, uh try to uh, harness to sort of double down on the work that an interest that we already have in addition to doing immediate covid relief which are many of us have been doing right supporting civil society on the front line to give basic things like food rations you know basic uh, preventive health things so that's been going on and that's going to be required for some more time unfortunately but truly as the reports are coming in from the ground there's still a lot of desperation out there so to meet those immediate needs of course private philanthropy has been doing stuff along with civil society but this is also a chance to think about the mid term and the long term how should personal philanthropy invest for creating a more flexible and resilient society and those are not just words because this is not the last pandemic nor has it been the first we have the effects of climate change that are already everywhere we have not put all the pieces together yet but we know things are coming so we how do we allow society to take the agency to be able to see what's coming and prepare adjust create the new kind of structures that are going to be needed the new kind of structures for cooperation for managing trade offs so you need a different kind of leadership you even need a different kind of follow followership so how do you uh, help civil society organizations to build those things this doesn't happen overnight but sometimes a trigger like this can help to mm -hmm. start that process and that's where i'm doing some of my investing as well right so it's changed the way you're looking you looked at philanthropy in the past vis-a-vis how you do much more immediate relief than i used to do because the crisis is so huge so i've doubled my budgets this year right and the uh, one area that i want to focus on is something that you're very passionate about as well which is education learning you've been working on this through akshara foundation you also publish books pratham is this an opportunity to reimagine learning as we go it because this has led to an accelerated shift to online classes recorded sessions but are those more short term fixes should, should we really reimagine the way learning happens and over the long term will this help improve the quality of learning compared to what we had so far you know chandra i genuinely believe this i've been working in the early childhood uh, early childhood and childhood learning sector for 21 years now to pratham to akshara foundation i co-founded pratham books where we reached millions of children with indigenous simple content very diverse content and then with extra for the last four and a half years right so the focus has been very much on how do we enable india's young children who have better opportunities to learn and how can we finally give them the system that they deserve 
and after 20 years is the first time I feel genuinely hopeful that because of many things that government has done, civil society has done over the decades, but also because of the technologies that have converged now, that mm -hmm. enable us to reimagine learning for every single child. So that no child is left behind for any reason whatsoever. And I think digital and online is a very critical component, but not the whole component, obviously. You need children to be surrounded by caring adults physically, not on a screen. Nothing should take away from that, and I'm not at all arguing for that. But I am saying, and I've been writing about this, that we must learn to accept the digital classroom or the digital idea of learning. Embrace it a little more. There is no perfection, so we'll make many mistakes. But if we don't experiment, you know, I think we will be being very, very, very unfair to the children whose future is digital. We have to equip them to become digital citizens. Nobody is going back on digital, right? So, of course, they need good old-fashioned schools, classrooms, personal interaction, physical interaction. But tell me, Chandra, when has it ever happened that you can remember in history where just children being together physically was dangerous for them? Exactly. We have to face such a situation. So now we have to reimagine, because as I said before, this is not the last health situation that's coming our way in this century, okay? And there can be floods, there can be earthquakes, there can be droughts, there can be uh, tornadoes, there can be so many things that will keep disrupting the school system. So we have to have plan B, which may have plan A in the future, which is that we are quickly able to switch when required to something that is a blend of physical and virtual. For that, we have to keep the virtual going. And we have to keep learning what works well, first for children, second for parents, and third for teachers and the education system. So that, right. just think, Chandra, a couple of centuries ago, right? Imagine the elite had to give up their private governess kind of education and enroll in a public school system in so many countries. Imagine the farming community, artisan community, which, which used to teach the children their own skills. Had, the parents had to completely shift the mindset to send children to public schools. So those kind of huge shifts have happened in the education sector before. Now it's one more. It's never easy. Change is scary and it's never easy. But this is that kind of shift again that harassed parents have to make. <laughs> I know parents are very harassed. It's not at all easy. I'm sure you are a harassed parent. <laughs> I've been tweeting about the, that. But we all have to try and make it for whose sake, for whose sake, for the sake of our children, the children of this country and their future. So but that's what I feel very strongly in this. Yeah. In fact, I just have a follow up to that. I can tell you a lot of parents and teachers keep the, and of course children keep the huge sigh of relief when the Karnataka government came out and said that you know what? We are not going to have online classes, no record sessions to put the standard. And they did this on grounds of equity, uh, learning outcomes, also health reasons. So uh, wh why do you think this means a real? Children learn every day in various ways. Why do they need an online session? Why do you think this means a See, the minute we believe in a structure, a socialized structure of a school, right? A physical school, we are accepting the idea that apart from individual tuition, from individual personalized learning, like me with a little child with a screen on her own, with the, the, uh, beyond what a, a caring parent can do, a caring grandmother can do, beyond that, we have accepted that children need a socialized setting in which to learn from peers and to have a common knowledge curriculum so that everybody has at least a common core from which they are learning, right? For that, we have accepted that it needs to be a school setting, right, for the most part. Now, when schools are not there, and we don't know when they will open, Chandra, and Bangalore now the cases are going up, God forbid that it gets any worse, but the state is doing whatever it can. But when there is so much uncertainty, and when we know that children can easily slip back, right, how can right. a parent do with a child at home without a structure, at least, even if it is for half an hour? 
you know even if you don't make it compulsory even if you keep you keep thinking how the curriculum can be more engaging so that it is not so stressful even perhaps you have smaller groups even if you shift the timings there are so many ways to experiment so that the parents uh, tension comes down mm -hmm. so that children mm -hmm. don't find it so stressful but tell me you have seen your own children we have all seen little children in front of a screen if they have a interesting interactive thing happening the joyful learning that we have seen possible you know i don't think we should prevent that i'm not saying spend them sitting in front of a screen for hours on end but bans like the karnat my government has banned online classes okay and i think bans are very easy to do for states no they have a monopoly on bans they can ban things so bans are easy but thinking through and evolving something that works is harder but much more necessary for the interest of the children and i i really worry about the digital divide chandra you know we should not do things that increase it see any children will 100% go to the best online classes in the world okay Correct. who will be left behind so i feel that don't ban okay that it's not a perfect answer to have online classes i want schools to open i want children to be healthy but we don't know when that will happen so at least allow experimentation keep an eye okay engage the private school system the government school system experiment learn drop what doesn't work but don't ban you know it goes back to the basic distrust we have of the private sector when it comes to education and health i think this right. sector right. has a genuine deep seated suspicion on the of the private sector and actually if you ask me i would happily turn back the clock and say let's socialize both let's have only the public sector deliver this but it's too late for that now you know in many countries in scandinavia they did that we didn't do that and now it's very hard to start that now when we don't exactly have the most competent state in the world so let's work with the private sector because the law allows for those schools to function right right then, then give them space give them space to expand that's where i'm coming from right but do you fundamentally believe that this is going to be one of those transformative changes that you spoke about that happened a century ago because ultimately we are seeing the habits we are seeing this revenge shopping happening where people are thronging malls uh, we are seeing people go back to restaurants uh, there is just this lockdown fatigue and people want to go back to business as usual people want to, there are children who want to go back to schools so are these going to be long term changes do you think it will fundamentally alter anything or is this going to be a three month six month experiment and then we are you know back to business as usual well and nobody can speak accurately about the future or at least anybody can say anything about the future because it isn't here yet uh, but i would think that yes some things are going to change because we are truly seeing some of our worst fears come to life right that a pandemic a tiny little virus that has taken over the whole world and we have understood that when it so in some sense we have developed a new muscle a new societal muscle to deal with something like this unprecedented and i think mm -hmm. we're going to keep we're going to keep exercising that muscle a little bit so that next time when something like this happens we are better prepared so i do think there is going to be a fundamental shift in how we think of eating how we think of travel how we think of learning and how we think of working right and uh, sorry yeah knowing the government is also pushing digital uh, platforms in a big way if you look at the diksha program uh, you have been involved with ekta foundation which is a collaborative platform for teachers uh, schools across the country to create content so like digital india like you know how this upi took off are we going to see the government also play a crucial role in the way education and learning outcomes happen across the country because we have state governments now who are printing qr codes on textbooks so is the push going to come from the state um i think so i am very uh, delightfully surprised uh, to see how proactive the union government has been and how many states have come on board to understand that the future has to be a blend of 
physical and virtual okay the qr code textbooks are all over the country and what it does is it builds a very nice bridge between the physical and digital world so that uh, a textbook is frozen and static and very 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 useful okay the textbook is the one book that you can find in every household of india so it is like a portal it is like a gateway to so many things for the children that use it so if you have if you can embed just a qr code in it and that qr code is not static the things that link to the qr code can be updated any time right so a child can get a, a very uh, updated idea say suppose he is learning about mars and with a qr code at the back of that lesson on mars now he knows all about the uh, the india's space program that happened yesterday right so i have yeah. like that idea and the state and union governments have adopted it very um, proactively and they are learning from each other i mean the states are learning from each other very quickly and adopting each other's best practices because they can do this very quickly there is no physical infrastructure involved so they can very quickly do this and they are monitoring because they get real time data so they know when it's working and they also know when it's not working so they can do course correction also quickly so yeah i'm very happy with what's happening and all of us have to get in, uh, all of us have to keep an eye so that no harm should be done right mm -hmm. but this has risks so um, we have to obviously watch out but at least i'm happy with the direction that the governments are taking on digital learning and they're they're being very creative i'm telling you the teachers on the ground Um, we have stories of how say one teacher will uh, sub, she knows her class right the teacher knows her children and she knows that this child needs a little extra help on this that he, i don't have time in the class to focus on her but i know she needs help in this particular subject so what she's been doing is copying the qr code of that particular thing which she thinks the child needs help on and she pastes it on the child's school bag and tells her that go home and use this qr code on your parents phone with them and see if you can equip yourself better for the lesson tomorrow so they've been experimenting they're getting feedback like this which is very heartening indeed right uh come to my part of the interview you know earlier uh, earlier on in the interview you spoke about uh, how you doubled your philanthropy budget for this year and you're focusing on initiatives that will give immediate relief uh, can you tell us a little about that in terms of your own work for the last few months when did you really feel that you know what this is the biggest crisis we are facing and that we need to double up yeah so uh, certainly we did quick relief with all the organizations that we are already working with because there's a lot of trust to them so anybody who came to us saying we are going to give basic uh, relief we said please go ahead and we said change your budgets do whatever you have to Uh, but that everybody did and that whatever we do is not going to be enough is the government that finally is going to have to to place uh, the kind of uh, effort needed to restore agency to people so that they can go back to their lives and livelihood so philanthropy is just like a bandage there but we did it and we did mm -hmm. some amount not as much as some of the others did but we did some but my focus now on doubling down for this year is to say in the sectors that i am interested in we will help those organizations to think more about what resilience looks like what should the communities be prepared for and so those budgets i am increasing in the areas that i am concerned with environment justice education uh, a little bit media but uh, a few <laughs> that's my my as well yeah Right. Uh, uh, final couple of questions. Um, are you working on your next book? What is it going to be on? Oh dear, I prefer to talk about my stuff after I've written it, so I can happily tell you about the children's two two new children's books that are coming out this year. One just next week or so, uh, and that's online because physical books are just not getting printed. Uh, and it it's about Shingeri Shinivas and the coronavirus, which I hope millions right. of children will be able to read. um and another book i'm doing with jagannath for children uh but of course one authors always want to write their next work uh but it's best to talk about it when it's written right finally you know a lot of people have been sharing accounts on social media how they've acquired new skills 
eh, be it hobby, be it cooking, be it something else. Uh, are there any new hobbies and interests that you acquired during the lockdown and perhaps you're going to be building on? Oh, yes. Uh, I have discovered that my phone has a camera that is out of this world. And <laughs> my garden has taken on a life of its own. Every insect, every bud, every leaf has been so much brighter in these last three months. And I've been photographing it till all my family is absolutely fed up of me. I'm constantly taking pictures of every leaf, every spider, every bird, everything <laughs> I can find. Last night, the Brahma Kamal the opened up on my terrace. It blooms only at from 10 to 3 a.m. And it's just divine. So it was the coming glory of this year's photography lessons in my own backyard. Hopefully we will see you on Instagram soon with all these oh, yeah, No, I'm not on social media. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, thank you very much, Rohini, for sharing your thoughts as always on very crucial areas, education, philanthropy, how we can really work together to rebuild society with others. Thank you very much for talking. Thank you, Chandra. Thank you so much. Thank you.